All right, so this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. We interview independent third-party candidates who are on the ballot and who are the only third option in their districts. And today we're interviewing Mike Fellows, Libertarian for the U.S. House at large in Montana. Montana only has one uh, U.S. representative running there. And Mike, thank you for calling in. How is it going tonight? It's just moving moving right along. All right, so we're moving right along. And you're the only third-party option in your uh, district, is that right? That's right. We're at large district, which means we've got one of the largest states to govern. We're just under a million in population. Yeah, yeah, and... um, and so the status quo would be the Republican versus the Democrats, and you're Libertarian, and you're going to be on the ballot this November 8th. And, um, as, and, and if people want to support you and look at your stance on issues, they can go to votefellows.org, V-O-T-E-F-E-L-L-O-W-S dot org. And you have a list of um, issues there. And uh, so... And that's very important. That's the uh, number one thing, you know, we probably want to know is, um, well, let's just, actually, there's a few things we want to know, but let's just start with the issues. Uh, You know, that's why you're running. You want to bring those issues to you with Washington, I suppose. And, yeah, if you could go over those issues with us, please, Mike. Well, this is a, you know, we have a, these are the things I have on my uh, campaign list here. One certainly is to protect our Second, Second Amendment. I think there's a plenty of people out here, especially in Montana, that want to talk about the Second Amendment, Second Amendment as, as a, something that's a, it's a hunting right. I have that. It, it, it was put in place to protect our hunting heritage. And that's really far from the point. I tend to agree with Penn and Teller and some of their uh, talks on the Second Amendment. It is that's what it says. It's 29 words and our right to keep your arms will not be in print. So, despite what the courts say, despite what everything says, the Constitution gave us these rights and the government can't take them away. Well, I also want to restore the force and protect our privacy. I think the, uh, the Patriarch has gone too far, especially Section 215, and so we got to deal with those things. I mean, it's going to be tough to actually get rid of the whole thing, but we can reform it so it's better for us, the citizens. And let's restore the forest. You know, the Fourth Amendment basically says we're safe in our papers and our property. Well, Congress. That's right. They, they just screwed that up over the years. And so they, they come to your property and seize it. They don't have a warrant. And even if you're not guilty, it's going to take you years. And you have to hire a lawyer and pay all this money just to get your stuff back. It's a very urgent process. It's never going to happen. So I, I, I believe in Judge Montana when he says they need a warrant. They have to go to a judge, get a warrant before they do all this stuff. So it never happens. Then you got things like balancing the budget. But we can accomplish that. You know, I, th- I think when we look at the, the Department of Education, it certainly would be a lot cheaper to abolish that, send that money back to the states, and let the states worry about education. Of course, then you've got line item things in the budget, like the Selective Service Commission. Well, over the years, they've been collecting $73 million a year for just collecting names in case we have a draft. That's less, that, that money could have been gone back to the taxpayers or could have, could have gone back to more important uses. And of course, we have a, an important war and we need to protect our security. I'm sure people will openly volunteer to, to sign up and protect this country. And then we are going to try to protect our individual states' rights. I mean, that's what the way the Constitution was basically set up, more so for the individual than the states, but... You know, there's certain things that we can do as well as harming 
our neighbor or harming somebody else, and we should be able to do those things. I guess the last thing on my list here is simply to allow individuals the choice on medical decisions. Of course, Montana has some things in the news here regarding medical marijuana, and I think people should have that choice if, it's, if it helps them. They should, have, they should be able to uh, use it versus the actual guns. And then you got all the veterans out there with their post-traumatic stress syndrome. You know, they should be allowed to use some of that too, but right now they're not. They're not giving that option. And it could be a better, better option than what, what they have on the table now for the VA. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you also mentioned fully informed juries, right? I do, because that's, that's, that's one of the things we push all the time. And basically, people, when they, when they get called, called up to jury duties, they, they have a lot of power. You can think of a jury as 12 independent judges. And so they listen to the testimony, they listen to the defense and the prosecution. And if they feel like the punishment doesn't fit the crime, or the guy's not guilty, basically, they can say he's not guilty, and they can't be punished for their crime. And this goes way back uh, to the trial of William Penn. Because back in England, they had the law in the books that said you couldn't preach anything but the Church of England. So here you got William Penn in one of these courtyards preaching Quakerism. Well, of course, that was illegal, so he, he got arrested, thrown in jail. And the jury just, they said that was a stupid law to begin with, so they wouldn't have convicted him. Well, the judge threw him in the, threw the jurors in a confined uh, cells for, for a number of days, and they wouldn't budge. And so they they still said not guilty. But it went up to the Magna, the English version of the Supreme Court, and they basically said, yes, jurors have this right to judge law and vote their conscience. And so that's where the Fully Informed Juries Association came in, we was trying to push that because there are times when you have to go up to the defendant and say, look, we're sorry. We had to convict you. We thought you were innocent, but the judge gave us the instructions and told us we had to. We didn't have a choice. And then you got things like the Peter Zinger trial in, in New York, back in the colony of New York, way back in the revolutionary days, where he basically, there's a law in the book that says you couldn't call the, the governor of Laos. Well, he had a newspaper, and so he called the governor of Laos, and he, he backed it up with all the, all the facts, and and they got him off on that one, too, based on the fact that everybody in the state of New York knew the governor was a Laos, and, and so, they, so they wouldn't convict Peter Singer. Yeah, so a jury, should, a jury does have the right to judge the law and vote their conscience. And, um, and then you also mentioned uh, jobs as well. Can you repeat that? Uh, you mentioned uh, jobs on your platform here. Jobs are created by the private sector. We don't need more short-term oh, right. on them. Yeah. yeah. No, because you got all these politicians that want to stand on a soapbox and say, I created this many jobs. You know, as if he had a pocket full of jobs, he'd get out. But, but the government doesn't create jobs, actually. They may reduce regulations. It's fun. Businesses to hire more people. They may do it that way, but it's basically the businesses coming forth with their money is hiring people, and as long as they have the money to hire people to keep their businesses going. And so when we try to punch in more regulations, it's not good for the businesses because they can't hire more people, or sometimes they have to cut people back. Because this minimum wage law that they're trying to get passed in California and I believe uh, Washington State, when the, when the minimum wage goes higher, what's going to happen to some of those employees? Well, they're probably going to have to get fired because you can't, can't afford to pay them. And you can't afford to hire new ones. You know, Bill Gates uh, said this in one of his things years ago, that you better be careful for what you wish for. Because he's talking about what's happening in Europe right now, where they got the touch screens when you order a McDonald's hamburger. So there's one person that's no longer needed. You just go up to the touch screen, 
pick what you want, slice your card, pay for it, and wait for your food. So that's kind of where we're going with with, with a lot of that uh, job stuff. Yeah, that's true. I mean, even at the checkout counter, a lot of places you can, you know, like Walmart and so on, you can just check out uh, yourself. Um, what, what about, um, so I have a list of some questions that I would like to ask you about. Um, and uh, so you just covered one of the questions I was going to ask you about, like regulation and competition for small and mid-sized businesses. Um, actually, let me ask you about this. Well, yeah, that you kind of touched on that. What about trade? Uh what do you think our trade policy should be with uh, foreign countries? Well, I think we should have free tra- free trade, basically. It may be hard to get free trade, but if I've got three apples and you've got four oranges, I may decide to say, hey, I, I could use three oranges. Can you use three apples? And that's that's free trade, but with all this NAFTA and GAFTA and, and those kinds of things, and it's more crony capitalist in a way because we've got we've got winners and losers, and that's the way these uh, contracts, these agreements are made are made to set up. So right now we're, we're giving subsidies to sugar, and we can already see the effects of doing that because your Oreo cookies are now being made in Mexico. Got some other things that are made in Mexico. The uh, the lifesavers you used to enjoy as a kid during Christmas time, they were made in Michigan, but now they're made up in Canada. So we're, we're, we're losing jobs based on trade agreements and regulations. Yeah. And do you think um, the, do you think there should be any election reform? Well, I mean, I think it would be nice to have none of the above on the ballot. That's, I don't think we'll ever see it, obviously. And then there's all kinds of different voting formats, like uh, uh, Like score voting. Well, I'm trying to think of its name, but it's it's just based on on your rank. You know, if you get this many votes, uh, you're going to move on to the... Well, actually, your votes are counted in the general election. There's rank so, voting, there's approval voting, and there's a uh, score voting and um, an instant runoff. Yeah, those are four different kinds of things like that. I think none well, of the I've, above would be great. But I think a lot of people do like ranked voting. You know, because in, in some of these local elections, like say Missoula, Montana, for instance, our city council, our primaries, we vote, we vote to send people to the general in September. And then, then, then you got another election in November. So it just seems for some of these local elections that, that if we just send the whole crowd into November and the person with the most votes wins their seat in whichever district they're running for, you know, rather than spend the money on a, another primary, which we don't need anyway. Well, um, I think if someone wants to know your issues on gun rights, we know where you stand with that. On um, spending um, on the Patriot Act, you're totally against the Patriot Act. Uh, The Fourth Amendment, you have mentioned on your website here. And, um, you know, uh, and being uh, juries, being able to vote their conscience, ending the drug war. Um, You know, you said here the military draft should be all voluntary. um, And uh, so... On civil liberties, um, civil rights, I think, uh, very strong. And um, trade, you think we should have free trade, but um, but you don't like the crony capitalism that's in some of these. So, so I mean, that's a you know pr- pretty um, consensus building type of uh, platform. And if someone is tired of the status quo, um, they do have another option. You're the only third party candidate who is running in your state of Montana, is that correct? Who's on the ballot? That's right. But I mean, when, when you look at things like the war, the war on drugs, it shouldn't be the war on drugs. It's the war on the Constitution. Because the war on drugs, everybody keeps saying we're losing the war on drugs. But then, is the other, is, is the other side winning? The side that, that's doing all the smoking and stuff? But it's the it's war on the Constitution because we're losing our Second Amendment rights because of the, the gang warfare 
we're losing our Fourth Amendment rights, obviously because police want to ca- want, they want to capture that stuff before it disappears, so they don't want to get a warrant in most cases. You know, the, the Fifth Amendment on search and seizures, they'd rather have it because that's the trouble with, with a lot of this stuff with your, with your local police. And they get a takeoff of all that. So they go in there and steal your nice car or whatever else you have. It's hard for you to take it back. But even if you're not guilty, they want to have it first. I mean, there's been several bills in the Montana legislature that basically said, you know, first you have to get a conviction. Once you get a conviction on that person, then you can take whatever it is that you're looking for. Until then, it's not going to happen. And they don't like that. They'd rather come in and take yourself first. Because, you know, you and I are, are not going to have the resources, for the most part, uh, to, to uh, retrieve that stuff. And so, yeah, that's a good point. I think um, everyone who has had their stuff taken by the government before being convicted, um, I mean, the regular populace should have to, you know, see the predicament that they're in, whether it's on the news or something. In fact, I saw something similar I saw a stat about a, a a couple months ago that actually asset forfeitures have surpassed total burglaries in the United States. Um, so, so that's something to think about. We're being uh, robbed. I think that stat was pertaining to more by our government than we are by you know um, burglars. Uh, so let me ask you this: How come you're not? Because, and I think I know the reason why, looking at these issues, but, I mean, how come you're not running as a Republican or a Democrat? How come you're choosing this third option, and how long have you been a Libertarian? I guess I've been uh, a Libertarian way back when, in 1980, when we got Eddie Clark on the ballot. But I've just got some, I've just got some principles, and I've seen too many people that have been sucked into both parties only to have them being shut up, basically. You know, fine, we don't want to... You know, the things that they've done to Ron Paul in, the, in these last two you know, presidential cycles, you know, that's what we've seen of the Republicans. And so is that something you want to be a part of? They're not going to listen to your 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 vote or your or your voice? That's what I, so I say, say now. So, so I've gone to the Libertarians and haven't looked back. Yeah, and they could give you two. I mean, you know, if you got elected, you would be elected for two terms. For I mean, for two years. And if people didn't like you, they could vote, or they didn't like the job that you did, they could vote you out. But um, I mean, you're putting yourself out there, presenting that you know you deserve um, a two-year uh, run here to see what you can do. Well, we come in for or else can have advantages because of the special interest and so on and so forth. And so it's going to always be tough to be incumbents, but they say that the incumbents' first re-election bid is always his toughest, no matter no matter what happens. Yeah. So we're probably set to see the incumbent get re-elected again, but you know anything can happen between now and, and November. People might just. I mean, eventually, someday I'm hoping that people, you know, how they look down the ballot, and if they're Republican, they just vote Republican. If they're Democrat, they just vote Democrat. They might not even know the names of the people. Someday, and hopefully this year, people are just going to look, and they're going to do the opposite. They're going to see a Republican and Democrat and pass on that. And if they only see one other option, they're going to pick it, <laughs> and and you're going to be there um, as a choice. So how's your campaign going? Um, are you uh, reaching out, uh, doing um, interviews? Are you Have you been invited to the debates? And uh, is there any debates um, for the U.S. House in Montana? Well, there have been about, about three of them that have had some, that had some health issues that precluded me from making many of those debates. But our last debate is going to be in Great Falls, Montana. I, I feel I'm and be there for that one. We've got a, another candidate forum up north in Sealy Lake, Montana, and I'm going to be up there for that one. So we're, we're getting out, and we've been to a few parades and 
We've been to a few fair booths and all the usual stuff out there. And so I'm right. pretty, pretty uh, optimistic about this election anyway. Yeah, and if um, and if people don't like you after two years, they're more than welcome to vote, you know, a Democrat or Republican yep, can, back in. They can vote you out. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let me ask you this: who have who are some of your favorite uh, people? Um, you know, like uh, Republican or or Democrat. I mean, just people in general. They they might not have been elected, or or maybe they're just someone in the private sector. Who are some of the people that you've been influenced on, uh, whether elected or not, um, whether they're currently alive or have lived in the past? Uh, who are some people that, you know, you've drawn influence from, if you don't mind sharing that with us? Well, I've kind of liked uh, Harry Brown. I've met him on a few occasions, and he was, he was always one person that could remember your name, and, and he spoke so clearly about things. Which is which is a good thing. He always said that the platform of the libertarians would never scare him because he could always find a way to talk about it. You know, he has people like Ron Paul. I've never, I guess, I briefly met him once because he was big into the fully informed juries for a while. And Larry Dodge was also one of the founders of the fully informed jury association. He's now long gone, but he put a lot of work in and energy in that organization to make it what it is today. You know, because people always thought it was kind of strange to have a, a nationwide organization from Hillville, Montana. Who ever hell heard of whole Hillville, Montana? You know, those are a, a few folks I, I enjoyed. Great. And, um, and how long have you been in Montana? Are you from Montana? Have Do you move there... More recently? Well, I've been here since about 70, 75. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah, my father was in the civil service, so he, we got back from a tour of Elijah's Air Force Base and moved back to Haver. All right. Well, well, definitely... Um uh, best wishes uh, and good luck in your campaign. And we do thank you uh, for taking the time to do this interview, to uh, informing our audience about their options available. Um, people can see more at libertarianprogressive.com, where we're going to have 50-plus interviews of independent third-party candidates who are on the ballot and who are the only third choice in their district. So, I mean, imagine... If there was an independent or third-party candidate elected, just at, even if it was just one, hopefully more, but even if it was just one from one of each of the 50 states, if Florida could elect just one, Montana could elect one, you know, I mean, California is a big state. It's almost could be considered a country. If they could just muster up one independent or third party, and then we as a collective could send... 50 plus representatives to Congress that would break the status quo. And um, now, do you have any final words here um, in, in regards to you know local issues or uh, just uh, some parting words here for tonight? Well, I think people just have to get out and vote. You know, know what the issues are. Look at all the candidates. Because I'm sure on a national level. Trump and Hillary are not saying much of anything. And so your choice there, Gary Johnson, would would make all the difference. We're still looking to get their 15% on his race so we can get him into the debates. And so we need everybody as we can to, to talk him up in these polls and see if we can't move him up so he, he gets into at least one debate. And then I invite uh, people to look at my Facebook page and uh, that's about it. Yeah, well, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time tonight, and we appreciate it. And, yeah, I hope, um, you know, uh, Gary gets in the debates. He definitely deserves to be in there. Uh, he's going to be on all 50 ballots. And um, and so if people want to check you out, it's votefellows.org, B-O-T-E-F-E-L-L-O-W-S, votefellows.org. And, um, you know, he's going to affect uh, policy on a nationwide level. So, I mean, if you have an interest 
in politics and uh you know we the people um in independent third party politics he's the only third party candidate in the state of Montana and um so we'd encourage you to spread the word and to get informed. Oh actually and S C W five candidates in Montana ballot. Well I mean but for the it. House you're the only one running for the right. House of Representatives right. besides the Republican or Democrat. Uh, yeah, there might be other candidates for governor or for Senate or, or other offices or for state offices. Um, were you going to say something about that? Are there other candidates? No, I was just going to say that, you know, with this election year, it's been kind of strange anyway, but we've got five candidates for the office of president and vice president that have made the Montana ballot. So it'll be a crowded ballot this year for that office. Well, I find co- uh, congressional races a little less divisive. I mean, you know, the Trump-Hillary thing, the people, depending on which camp that they're in, they're very divisive. But you can you can talk to almost anyone about Congress because they know they're just one out of 435 people, and not any one of them are going to, you know, have complete control so you have to work right. within a body of 435 people and um you know if we had proportional representation we would already have a bunch of libertarians and green party and independents but but we don't so it's you know kind of a winner takes all and so it's we we can't wait for anyone else to do this uh, we've got to take responsibility get active and the way to have accountability is voting and and taking action and taking responsibility and um, so, Michael, it's been a pleasure, Mike. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, we appreciate it. And um, so good luck in your campaign. And I hope you have a very good night, sir. Thanks very much. Thank you as well. Take care, sir. You're welcome.